Hi everyone, so today we're gonna go over our last topic for the course, which is the binomial theorem. So what is a binomial expression? Well, an, a binomial expression is just um, the sum of two terms. Now these algebraic expressions, we can call them expression one and expression two, can be something a little bit more complicated. But to sort of simplify the beginning of this, let's just consider it as x plus y. And x and y, these are variables that could represent some more complicated terms. So you could have something expression one and expression two. And you can generalize what we're going to talk about in just a second. But if I gave you this binomial expression, x plus y, and asked you to take powers of it, then those powers, it turns out, will actually have a somewhat nice pattern to them. So if I give you this expression, raise it to the zeroth power, well, we know that that'll be 1. If I raise it to the first power, well, then I'm just going to get back what I started with, right, x plus y. And if I square it, this is where you first learn about you know, foiling, right? So you had x plus y x plus y, and you would have to use the distributive property, right? So you'd have the first two terms would multiply to give you x squared, then the second, um, the first and the last, right, um, uh, would give you an xy, and then you'd have another xy, and then you have a y squared. So you'll have x squared plus 2xy plus y squared for the square of this expansion, right? And then if you cube it, you would take this, the squared version, and you'd multiply by another x plus y, and you'd use your distributive property and expand it out, and you'd end up with a somewhat nice result in the end. And if you stare at this a little bit, you'll notice that there are some features of this, right, in general. Notice that um, your power of x decreases by 1 each time. Your power of y increases by 1 each time. And it seems like there might be some kind of pattern for these coefficients, right? These coefficients here. It seems like they kind of follow some sort of symmetry property, right? I start with a 1 and I end with a 1, um, right? And then there might be some pattern here. Some of you might have seen this before. That pattern can be expressed many different ways. Uh, if you have seen it before, usually you talk about Pascal's triangle, and we will talk about that in just a little bit. But first, I want to just show you what the actual theorem says. So the binomial theorem looks like this. So uh, let x and y be variables. They could be more complicated expressions. Okay, And let n be greater than or equal to 0, be an integer. Then it turns out that x plus y to the n can be represented in this way. So in sigma notation, it would be nice and short. It would look like this. So it would be the sum from j equals 0 to n, and you have these terms, which is uh, n choose j, right? Do you remember those uh, combinations that we uh, talked about in, a pre in the previous lecture? And you have x to the n minus j and y to the j. OK, now in the expanded version, it's a little bit easier to kind of see that there are some general patterns here. So the expanded version of this looks like this. You have n choose 0. And then you'll have n choose 1, n choose 2, n choose n minus 1, all the way up to n choose n. So we actually have n plus 1 total terms here. But these, uh, these coefficients here, we can actually call these the binomial coefficients. Binomial coefficients. Okay. Now, the last time, we did have a definition for this. These... Uh, these combinations, right, or binomial coefficients in terms of factorials, right? So for example, n choose 2 was n factorial divided by 2 factorial times n minus 2 factorial. And that still applies here, but we will also have a nice pattern that uh, I'll describe in just a little bit. As long as n isn't too big, uh, you might want to use this nice Pascal's triangle we'll show at the end. But if n is rather large, then you'd want to go back to the factorial uh, definition. Okay. Now, uh, what else do we have here? Well, notice the power of x starts off as x to the n. And then the second term is x to the n minus 1, and then x to the n minus 2, and so on, until you get x to the 0. Okay, and then the y terms are increasing by 1 each time, right? So you have y to the 0, then y to the 1, y squared, and then so on and so forth, all the way to y to the n. So you kind of see that you have this pattern that we had up above, right? The x term, the power of x decreases by 1 each time, power of y increases by 1 each time, and now we actually have a way to compute these special coefficients here, and it turns out to be something we are somewhat familiar with now. 
Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we'll just expand a few of these and see if we can do this. Okay, now if I just gave you x plus y to the fourth, the way you would have done that before is you would have just foiled it out, right? But now we have the binomial theorem. And in general, this might be quite useful for having to avoid uh, using the distributive property many, many times, okay? Or if you're interested in one specific term in here. Okay, so x plus y to the fourth, using our formula, what is, what is n in this case? So n is equal to 4, right? So we'll have 4 choose 0, x to the 4. And then we'll have 4 choose 1, x to the 4 minus 1, which is going to be cubed. And then y to the 1. And then 4 choose 2. And uh, then we'll have x to the 4 minus 2, uh, y squared. And then 4 choose 3. And then you have x to the 4 minus 3, y cubed. And then finally, 4 choose 4, uh, x to the 4 minus 4, which is x to the 0, which is 1, and then y to the 4th. So see, that's why in this last one, don't even include that power of x because it's going to be x to the 0. But I'm just showing you how the pattern actually you know, right, works. Okay. <laughs> now, each of these coefficients, you can use the classic uh, definition, right? which is 4 factorial over 0 factorial, and then 4 minus 0 is 4 factorial. Uh, but this is 4 over 4, so 4 factorial over 4 factorial is a 1, right? So this coefficient will end up being a 1. This will end up being a 4, and we have x cubed, and y to the 1 is y. And um, this 4 choose 2, you can check that that's 6. 4 factorial over 2 factorial times 2 factorial, that's 6 and x squared y squared and then plus this will also be a 4 uh, x to the 1 uh, y cubed and then finally 4 choose 4 is also 1 and we will get uh, well x to the 0 right you can write that and then uh, y to the fourth so in the end you end up with this okay now um, I'm going to show you when n is small how you can get these coefficients using that Pascal's triangle. But again, if you if you want for each one of these, you could write it out using the definition that we had from last time uh, in simplifying them. Okay, uh, then y to the fourth. So the coefficient. So notice there is um, we still have this nice pattern, right? The power of x decreases by one each time. The power of y increases by one each time. And then now we have these uh, binomial coefficients. Okay. And do you see that one one property is that you maintain this symmetry, right? The first and last terms are the same, uh, one and one, and then you have the four and the four and the six kind of in the middle. Um, that will be a property that um, you'll see in this uh, in general. Okay. Now, what happens if you end up with more complicated expression than just x plus y to the fourth? Let's say instead of that y, we, uh, we have this negative 2y. So you can write that. So x minus 2y to the fourth. You can really just write that as x plus negative 2y to the fourth power. And so you see you have your same first expression as x, but the second expression isn't just a y. It's actually negative 2y, uh, right? And n is the same here. So n equals 4. So you already did all this work out. You see that you've already expanded all this. It'll actually be exactly the same. It's just instead of a y for, for all of these, you actually will have this negative 2y, OK? OK, so we will have just kind of carrying the work that we already did here. You'll still have x to the fourth plus 4x cubed. But instead of a y, you actually have this negative 2y, right? Uh, and then plus 6x squared and then negative 2y squared, right? So instead of a y here, it's actually this negative 2y. And we'll leave it in parentheses. And then plus 4x negative 2y cubed, and then finally negative 2y to the fourth. OK, and then we can simplify this a bit, right? So this is x to the fourth plus 
So negative two times this is actually a negative eight, right? Negative eight x cubed y, and then this will be negative two squared, which is positive four times six is 24 x squared y squared, and then negative two cubed is negative eight times four is negative 32 x y cubed and uh, negative two to the fourth is positive 16. So positive 16 y to the fourth. So this is our final expansion of x minus two y to the fourth power. Okay, so let's say that I gave you an expression like this, x, uh, 5x minus 7y to the 20th. Now, if you wanted to expand that fully using the, um, using the uh, binomial theorem, we could do that, right? What is n here? n is 20. And by binomial theorem, by the binomial theorem, this would be equal to what? Well, it would be the sum from j equals 0 to 20, uh, 22's j. And then you would have your two expressions here are 5x and minus 7y. So we'd have 5x to the 20 minus j. And then you would have the minus 7y to the jth power. Okay, So you could expand this whole thing out and figure it out. But here, I'm just curious, what is the coefficient of x to the 7th, y to the 13th? So here, the binomial theorem can still help us, right? What uh, all we have to actually do to solve this problem is what would j actually have to be? Well, if, notice that if I just look at the power of y here, when would I get a y to the 13th? Well, that would be when j is 13. So consider the term when j is equal to 13. So what would that be? So this would be. 20 choose 13, 5x to the 20 minus 13, which would be 7, okay? And then minus 7y to the um, uh, to the 13th power, right? And then if you look at this a little bit, you'd have 20 choose 13, 5 to the 7, x to the 7, right? And then minus 7 to the 13th, y to the 13th. Okay, so 20 choose 13, 5 to the 7 minus 7 to the 13 is, and then times x to the 7, y to the 13. So this is the coefficient. This is the coefficient of x to the 7th, y to the 13th. Okay. Now, a lot of times, actually, you might, um, if you take some future courses beyond this course, sometimes uh, these coefficients might actually be counting something that could be uh, complicated. So sometimes you actually want to know what these coefficients are. And binomial theorem can, can really help us tackle uh, which, uh, what are the actual coefficients of some complicated binomial expansion. Okay. Similarly, let's do the same exact uh, expression, but what would the coefficient of x to the 12 y to the 8th be? Well, in this situation, it looks like j would actually have to be 8, right? So consider the term when j is equal to 8. Okay, so then we would have uh, 20 choose 8 right, 5x to the 20 minus 8 minus 7y to the 8th. Okay, so this would be 20 choose 8, and then you'll have 5 to the 20 minus 8 is 12, and then you have minus 7 to the 8th, and you will have x to the 12th and a y to the 8th. Okay, so the actual coefficient will be this. Uh, I'm keeping the answers like this because if you actually expand these, these are going to be quite large numbers. And leaving them like this, it's actually much easier to kind of see that we actually did the process correctly. And this is good enough. Okay. Now, for this last one here, this is saying, what is the coefficient of x to the 7th, y to the 14th in this expansion? Now, it's exactly the same original expression. But if you stare at this a little bit, you'll notice that there's a little bit of an issue here because the sum of those exponents, sum 
of these exponents is actually 21, right? And not 20. So you're never going to be able to actually get uh, something where you have an x to the 7th and a y to the 14th, right? Because if you want a y to the 14th, you would actually have j is 14. And then that would mean x is 20 minus 14. So the power of x would actually have to be a 6, right? The sum of these has to add up to 20. Okay, but that's not actually what's happening here. So the, what would the coefficient be? Well, you could think of this as being in that expansion, but it would actually have a coefficient of 0, right? So the coefficient is 0, right? Because that term doesn't actually exist in this expansion. But you could kind of pretend it exists with a coefficient of 0. So it's like it's there, but it's not really there, right? <laughs> OK, uh, now another thing that you can actually do with the binomial theorem is you can establish some, um, some other relationships that are involved between um, uh, bi those binomial coefficients you can, so, and exponents. So for example, we can establish this corollary right here that says if n is a uh, non-negative integer, so n greater than or equal to 0, an integer, it turns out that if you were to add, so look at what this is actually saying. This is saying that if you were to add up all those binomial coefficients, so this is n choose 0 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 2 plus dot 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 plus n choose n, this is actually equal to 2 to the n. So that's kind of an interesting uh, result if it is true, right? Now, there's a couple ways that you can attempt the proof of this. You could actually prove that using induction, just like you could actually prove the binomial theorem by induction. But uh, if you, if you want to do that uh, before um, you actually attempt it, you might want to know this identity at the very end that I'll show you. OK, but there's sort of a shortcut to this. If we know the binomial theorem, we can actually establish that result as a corollary. Okay, So if I somehow use the binomial theorem in a clever way, I can actually establish this. And how do you do that? Well, look at what you have here. You actually have this 2 to the n. Okay, Now, in the current form, it's actually not a power of a binomial. right? But what we can do is we can sort of make a binomial expression appear. And do you agree that 2 is actually just 1 plus 1, right? So I'm writing 2 now as a binomial uh, expression. And I'm going to raise this to the nth power. Now, it looks like you're going to make things more complicated by doing that. But I have the binomial theorem. So the binomial theorem says that, well, I have a binomial expression. So I can, and I'm raising it to the nth power. So this will be the sum from j equals 0 to n of n choose j. And then I will have 1 to the n minus j. And I, that's the, my first term, my first expression, right? And then the second expression is also a 1. So I have another 1 to the j. But, but look at this a little bit. What's 1 to a power? Well, 1 to this stuff up here is still 1. So I have the sum from j equals 0 to n. n choose j. This is a 1. And this is a 1, right? So I really just have the sum of these n choose j's. And that's exactly what we have here, right? I just happen to use a k instead of a j. This this variable j is meaningless, right? You could use k instead of j. Or you could just write it out, right? This is n choose 0 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 2, so on and so forth, all the way up to n choose n. And look at what you have. You have that 2 to the n. You rewrote it in a clever way. And you use the binomial theorem to write out what that ex what that says, and it turns out that it's that it establishes this result. So that's actually kind of interesting because this is saying that if you were to sum the coefficients in sort of a basic uh, expansion, that would be two to the n. And if you go all the way back to the beginning up here, you will actually see that if you if you um, uh, add these coefficients up. Well, I have a 1. That's 2 to the 0, right? What's the two coefficients here? I have 1 and a 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2. 
and that's 2 to the 1, right? What about here? I have 1 plus 2 plus 1. That's 4. And 4 squared is, I'm sorry, and 2 squared is 4. And then I'll have 2 cubed. What's 2 cubed? That's 8, right? So 8, do I get 8? So I have 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1. So 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 is definitely 8. So that's kind of neat. That actually works out. And that'll be a property that I'll mention also uh, when we talk about the Pascal's triangle. Okay. Could we do that another way? Okay, so here's another one. This one says that if you add up, so let's expand this. What does this look like? All right, so here is the sigma version of this, okay? But if you were to plug in k equals 0, then you have uh, negative 1 to the 0, which is 1, and then you have n choose 0, okay? And then negative 1 to the 1, is negative so you see that this is this negative one to the k is just going to alternate between positive one and negative one so it'll actually be n choose zero minus n choose one plus n choose two minus n choose three plus n choose four and then minus da 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 all the way until you get to that last term which would be negative one to the n n choose n right now we don't know if n is even or odd so I'm just going to leave it like that. But do you notice that if it's an even, it's got a plus in front. But if it's an odd, if you're choosing an odd, then it's going to have a negative in front. And then this is saying it's actually equal to 0. So that's interesting. That's saying if you kind of take, take these coefficients and you sum them in an alternating way, they'll actually sort of annihilate and you'll just get 0. Okay. Now, again, you could prove this using induction. Uh, but I'd rather prove it as a corollary to the binomial theorem. So how do we do that? Well, there it looks like there's no exponent here. So, a tr But this does look like something that might appear in a binomial expansion, right? Because binomial expansion, if you have the sum from k equals 0 to n, and you have an n choose k here, you're sort of trying to make an expression where you have a negative 1 in there somewhere. And I'm, I want it to be equal to 0. So here's the trick to this one. Do you agree 0 is the same as 0 to the n, as long as n is, uh, let's say, a positive integer? Okay. We don't uh, allow 0 to the 0. That's actually called an indeterminate form. Um, if you take calculus, you'll we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. Um, sometimes in combinatorics, you actually allow that to be 1. But in, uh, in calculus, that's definitely indeterminate. So we're going to assume n is positive. But if n is a positive integer, Hopefully you agree that if you just multiply 0 by itself over and over again, this is 0. And then now here's the clever part. I want a negative 1 to appear. Can I make a negative 1 appear? Well, what I could do is I could just say 1 plus negative 1 to the n. Okay. So I turn 0 into 1 plus negative 1 to the n. So hopefully you still agree that 0 is equal to this. But look at what I have now. I have a binomial. Um, power, right? I have a binomial expression raised to the nth power, so I can use the binomial theorem, which says what? Well, let's write out what the binomial theorem says. I'm going to use k's now instead of j's just so it matches this theorem, but uh, if you can use a j, it doesn't matter. So k uh, goes from 0 to n, and it'll be n choose k, and then the first uh, expression is a 1, so it'll be 1, and then n minus k, and then you have a negative 1, is your second expression raised to the kth power. Okay, And then what is this right here? This is k equals 0 to n, n choose k. And 1, this is just 1, right? 1 to anything is just 1. And then I have this negative 1 to the k. And that's exactly what we have up here. And then look, you just showed 0 is equal to this expression. So you're actually done. right? And if you want, you can expand it again. And that's perfectly fine. So the, the trick is sometimes if you want to establish these relationships or uh, formulas that involve these binomial coefficients, the binomial theorem is a great way to help you establish that, especially if you ever see that you have some, um, some kind of property involving the sum of binomial coefficients. That's usually uh, the way to tackle these kinds of problems. OK, now moving on, uh, could we do that again? Well, here, this one, maybe this one is a little bit less shocking. Look at what you have. You have a sum, and it already has binomial coefficients in it. Okay, So if you ever see a sum, and you have binomial coefficients, 
the first thing you should be thinking of is binomial theorem, okay? Because it's going to be a really useful technique for kind of um, uh, tackling uh, formulas that involve these, okay? Again, you could use induction here to prove this, but we don't need to, all right? So apparently this sum will be equal to three to the n. So if it's true, there's probably a way to rewrite three to the n so that I can use binomial theorem. Now, the next trick that you might want to think of is, okay, I got to turn this into a binomial expression to the nth power. And there are infinite number of ways to do that, right? I could do zero plus three. I could do two plus one, right? And so on. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from even using something more complicated than integers here. But look at what's involved. I have a two here, right? So probably is going to be a one plus two, all right, if it works. And by binomial theorem, and you can even indicate that you can you could write here by binomial theorem if you want. Uh, this will be n choose k, and then the first term is a one, so it'll be one to the n minus k, and then the second expression was a two, so that'll be two to the k, and then look at what you have right here. So you have k equals 0 to the n, n choose k, and this right here is a 1, and then 2 to the k is 2 to the k, and that's exactly what we have. Okay, So it's a very, very useful technique for establishing these uh, results. So this one is kind of saying if you take the binomial coefficients and you tack on a power of 2, it turns out that that'll give you powers of 3, or exactly 3 to the n. Okay. All right, now... Here is Pascal's triangle. So you might have seen this before, Pascal's triangle. You kind of just, um, you write out, um, it's, it's just sort of a, a way of building out the coefficients, the binomial coefficients. So you kind of have this property where you, you, you have a bunch of ones going one diagonal of the triangle, a bunch of ones going the diagonal of the other triangle. And you'll notice that they actually have this pattern. First of all, the rows, are in you you have rows okay which give you the coefficients right so do you remember the original uh the original coefficients that we had for x to the you know x plus y to the zero was actually one so that is the first coefficient x plus y to the first was x plus y so here are your two coefficients a one and a one right one and a one and then x plus y squared was x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. So your coefficients are 1, 2, and 1. And notice you have a 1, 2, and 1, and so on. So the cube, the coefficients were 1, 3, 3, and 1. And remember the first problem we worked on, we had a 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. So where are these numbers coming from? Well, they're coming from this. You could write them using the binomial um, the coefficient form, right? The like uh, n choose k. All right, this is the other way of writing them. Okay, but but what's neat with the Pascal's triangle is as soon as you start these ones in these diagonals, how you get these numbers is you actually just, this two is the sum of the, the two that are above it, okay? This three is the sum of the two numbers that are in the row up right up above it, right? This three is the sum of two and one, this 4 is the sum of 1 and 3. This 6 is the sum of 3 and 3. This 4 is the sum of 3 and 1. So you see, you actually have this nice pattern that you can get the next row. Like, look at this. If I want to get... So, all right. So let's say that you've already determined the fourth up to the fourth row, right? How do you determine the fifth row? Well, you would take the sum of 1 and 4 to get 5, and then the sum of 4 and 6 to get 10. 6 and 4 will give you 10 as well, and 4 and 1 will give you 5, and then finally you have the 1. So you start off by writing out the 1s on the uh, diagonals here, and then you'll kind of fill it in as you go. Okay, so let me just illustrate that. You would just start with a 1, you have 1 and 1, and then you have 1 and 1, and then this 2 here. All right. So then 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, four, one, and so on. So you kind of would build this uh, Pascal's triangle 
using that simple procedure of just adding the previous two up above it to get the next one and so on. And if n isn't too big, you can do this uh, pretty quickly, right? But if n is quite large, you're probably not going to want to <laughs> fill up Pascal's triangle because if I do n to the 100th, right, to write out the 100th row, uh, that recursive property would take you quite a while. But you still have the definition for these things. You can, for example, I can figure out that this coefficient, without figuring out all of these ones up above it, is, is what? So 6 choose 3 is 6 factorial over 3 factorial, and then 6 minus 3 factorial, Okay, which is 6 factorial over 3 factorial, uh, 3 factorial, which is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 factorial over 3 factorial, 3 factorial, get some reduction. 3 factorial is 6, right? 3 times 2 times 1, right? So I have 6 times 5 times 4 over 6, and this is 20. Okay? So this guy is 20, and if you see, it's actually right here, right? It actually matches this as 20. So that is just to illustrate that sometimes it might be faster to do the factorial. Sometimes if the n isn't large enough, isn't too big, you might want to do the previous, um, the previous rows. But what does this establish? Now, if you write it in terms of these n choose k binomial forms, then this will give you a general property that you could try to prove. Do you see that you could try to prove that 4 choose 2 is the sum of 3 choose 1 and 3 choose 2. So if I add these together, I should get this. And similarly, if I want to get 6 choose 3, I could take 5 choose 2 and add it to 5 choose 3. So what would the general formula look like? What's the general property? Well, it would look like this. And we call this the Pascal's identity because that's exactly how you built up the Pascal's triangle. Uh, let n and k be positive integers where n is greater than or equal to k. Then this next coefficient that you're looking at in the next row is the sum of the two that are kind of right up above it in the Pascal's triangle. And they would be exactly this. So n choose one, uh, n plus 1 choose k should be n choose k minus 1 plus n choose k. So look up here. So you have 6, which is your like n plus 1. So that would make n 5, right? So I need 5 choose 2 plus 5 choose 3, right? So 5 choose 1 less plus 5 choose 3. So you see how this is the general version of what we're, what we're um, expecting. Okay, So let's see if we can actually prove that this is true. So if we can prove that this is true, then this is sort of the, a legitimate pattern that we actually have among these binomial coefficients. Okay, Now, one, uh, there are some patterns we already did prove. For example, uh, a row in this Pascal's triangle we proved that if you sum up a row, it should be 2 to the n, right? So for example, n uh, equals 4. What's 2 to the 4? That's 16, right? And what happens if we add this row up? 1 plus 4 plus 6 plus 4 plus 1. So I have 10 plus 6 is uh, 16. So 16, it's correct, right? Uh, and so forth. So uh, 2 to the 5th is 32. So 20 plus 30 plus 2. Yeah, so that's correct. We already proved that. And if you alternate the sum, you should get 0, right? So 1 minus 5 plus 10 minus 10 uh, plus 5 minus 1, right? So you kind of see that these are in opposite signs then, right? So 1 uh, minus 5 uh, plus 10 minus 10 plus 5. Wait, is that right? Yes, yes, that's right. Right, right, right. So if you did 1 minus 5 plus 10 minus 10 plus 5 minus 1. So you see that the there are opposite signs. So it would add up to 0. That was the second one that we actually proved up above. OK, so let's actually prove this uh, Pascal's identity. How would you do that? Well, um, let's just use the definitions. OK, let's just actually use the definition for these binomial coefficients, the original definition. Okay, and let's actually start with the right side and see if we can combine the two of these to get 
to the left side. That's probably going to be easier to do because these are going to be two fractions, right? And usually it's easier to combine two fractions to get one fraction. So I think that'll be the best strategy. So let's see if we can simplify n choose k minus 1 plus n choose k using the definition and get the left-hand side of this. Okay, so by definition, this n choose k minus 1 should be n factorial over k minus 1 factorial and then n minus k minus 1 factorial. I think it's a good problem to do this because at least right at the beginning it highlights that it's very important to put these parentheses here because when you distribute these negatives it's very easy to make some simple errors here. Okay, So you have n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial. So then we have n factorial over k minus 1 factorial. And then this right here is actually n minus k plus 1, right? So n minus k plus 1 factorial. OK, and then n factorial over k factorial, n minus k factorial. All right, now if you want to add two fractions together, they must have a common denominator, right? And if you look over here, this one has a, they're pretty close actually, right? So notice you have k minus 1 factorial on this one and a k factorial over here. So which one has more terms in it? Well, if I ha add in a k over here, so if I multiply this fraction by a k over a k, do you see that this? it'll bump this guy up to a k factorial then. You see that? Like that'll become a k factorial. And then this term over here is n minus k factorial, and this is n minus k plus 1 factorial. So this one is actually bigger than the one over here. So you see what I need to multiply this fraction by is n minus k plus 1 divided by n minus k plus 1. And then this expression should simplify to n minus k plus 1 factorial. Right? OK, so let's do that. So now we will get, OK, so we have k. You know what, let me, uh, since I need a little more room already, let's write it over here. So we have k n factorial over, and then this will be k factorial, and then n minus k plus 1 factorial plus n factorial n minus k plus 1 over k factorial, and then n minus k plus 1 factorial. And now they actually have matching denominators, so I can add them. Uh, and I will get k n factorial plus n factorial n minus k plus 1. <coughs> and then over k factorial n minus k plus 1 factorial. OK, and then now I can factor out this n factorial, these two terms up in the numerator. Uh, I have n factorial, and then I'll have k plus n minus k plus 1 all over k factorial n minus k plus 1 factorial. And uh, this simplifies a little bit, right? Because I have k plus. So these k's are going to uh, cancel. You know what? Let me use another color here. So I have green. So these k, this k is going to cancel with this k. You know what? Maybe that's not dark enough. Um, go back to the red. OK, so this k and this k are going to cancel, right? Because it's k minus k. So then what do you have left over? We have, OK, n factorial, and then we have an n plus 1 all over k factorial n minus k uh, n minus k uh, plus 1 factorial. OK, now what do we want this to be equal to? We want this to actually be equal to n plus 1 choose k. All right, now up top I actually do have an n plus 1 factorial. Look, we have n plus 1 factorial. And we want to be able to choose k. So we actually have the k factorial. And then here what we would want is the top 
minus you know the top which is n plus one excluding the factorial so and we do have an n plus one there and then look you would subtract k I'm just kind of moving these terms uh, just swapping them uh, so you can see that this is indeed n plus one choose k right because that would be n plus one factorial divided by k factorial and then n plus one minus k all factorial that whole thing in parentheses so that that actually did work out awesome yeah there are actually alternative ways to do all of these proofs as well using what's called a combinatorial proof but um, we just don't have time to show you all of these methods now if you do go on and you take a uh, if you take the uh, combinatorics course you'll definitely see some uh, these combinatorial proofs and uh, if you if you go on to take maybe discrete math 2 you would touch on some other topics such as uh, relations and algorithms a lot more applications in that class um, this is to teach you all the foundations of the proofs and then you would actually be able to see some of these applications also if you're interested in in uh, graphs or graph theory I touched on uh, what a graph looks like at the end of the uh, Ramsey theory stuff that I, I mentioned before uh, graphs have lots and lots of applications and those are touched on in discrete math too but also if you ever want to take a course in graph theory we occasionally offer that as well and that's the area of research that I actually uh, work in so um, yeah uh, I uh, yeah